They both have animals that are kept in cages or pens, and they both have the animals on display for the public to see. But a zoo and an animal sanctuary have a distinct difference, and it has to do with how each acquires its animals. The sanctuary does not breed or buy their creatures. Rather, they take those that are unwanted or unable to survive in the wild. And as Eliana Sheriff shows us, the journeys of a sanctuary's caretakers can be as compelling as the animals themselves. Eliana? The animals make it their home, but it's the people at the Spirit of the Hills Wildlife Sanctuary who make it possible. But for one man in particular, the struggle to relate to people compelled him to create this four-legged family as the man behind the fence. Roughly two miles from town, down a bumpy gravel road, is an animal kingdom nestled in the northern hills. It began with a man who came from far further north, giving in abundance what he was deprived of as a child. Just growing up in Canada, I had a father that liked uh, partying and drinking and his friends, I think, more than he liked his family. So being an only child, I spent a lot of time alone, like on a, a little farm type thing out of town. And I grew up with animals and they were like my friends and I understood them. That mutual understanding between Michael Wilczynski and animals. You know, talking to sheep and dogs and horses or whatever. And they accepted me as, uh, I don't know, like as one of them. Is what led him to where he is today, in Spearfish, living on site with the animals he cares for. Michael says after running a sanctuary for seven years in the true north, he decided to move down to the Mount Rushmore state. After some South Dakotan visitors saw what he was doing there and asked him to do it here. In fact, they even donated land for the sanctuary. People said it'd never be done, like you can never move exotic, whatever animals across an international border. And I was like, wow, that's like, that's a challenge. But after seven months of paperwork and a long haul, he moved 203 animals across the border. I always say just like young and dumb because sometimes when I look back, I was like, wow, who was that person who did that? And so for the past 16 years, the Black Hills have been his home. You know, I'm here on a mission to do something good. Well, I think it's good. You know. Some days are harder than others, and there are some tasks he prefers to delegate. There's, there's been several times where I've had to cut up cows and horses by myself. While Michael is squeamish about butchering cows, he doesn't mind shoveling manure. Keeping the safe haven up and running keeps Michael running too. And it's not cheap either, costing around $160,000 a year to operate. Still, Michael, who's been helping animals for more than two decades, sometimes ponders if he's doing enough. I guess in, in, inside of me, there's always like, it's never enough, there's, there's never enough. And, um, and a lot of people say, you know, well, if you can't do that, change, you know, change your life or do something, do something else or, or, or the famous words, get rid of them. Like, how do you, with anything, how do you get rid of something? But for the Canadian caretaker, now home in the hills, giving up is not an option. Tomorrow night, a closer look at the animals. We'll hear how some of them got there and how they all get taken care of. That's in part two of Behind the Fence, Voices of the Wildlife Sanctuary. Last night we showed you how the spirit of the Hills Wildlife Sanctuary took root in the northern hills. Tonight we'll take a closer look at the animals who take refuge there. How are they cared for and where do they come from? Eliana Sheriff brings us part two of her special report, Behind the Fence, Voices of the Wildlife Sanctuary. Eliana? After working alongside volunteers, I learned just how heartbreaking some of the animals' stories are. Some of them are seized, many of them surrendered, and others, by no fault of their own, just dumped. But thanks to the sanctuary, they are not forgotten. All these animals are named, but I don't remember the names of all of them. <laughs> and everything with a name has a story. The over 300 animals come from all over, from seized exotic cats, vicious dogs that the owner surrendered, and some just dropped off without any notice. Or even animals that aren't dangerous or hard to handle, just creatures that were no longer wanted, like potbelly pigs. They get them because they're cute, and then they overfeed them, so guess who gets them? Some people dump them without even respect for what the animal's going through. 
Like a dog will stop eating for five days because he's waiting or she's waiting for her family to come back. Feeding the animals is much like conducting an orchestra with every part crucial to the success of the performance. It starts early in the morning with sorting fruit, peeling labels. That's one thing. This is not a good job for manicure. (laughs) The majority of the fruits, vegetables, dog food, and fish come from local grocery chains, including Safeway, Looters, and Walmart. Much of the meat is donated either by hunters or on this day, a 1,600-pound cow that was hit by a car. It's a job not for the faint of heart. This is way better than burying it or throwing it in the dumpster. Enduring the smell of a rotting carcass is not a highlight of working at the sanctuary. But Devin Pincock does it because he knows that getting his hands dirty means giving the carnivores the food they need. Those animals get a better life because of this. Eating the internal organs and hair is good for them as it simulates what it'd be like hunting for food in the wild. Uh, We go out, we do all our hunting, we do our own butchering. I take all the good parts that uh, are edible for us. And the rest becomes a feast fit for a king. Feeding time isn't limited to the big animals. There are around 80 birds at the sanctuary. Many of them are aggressive because they lack proper socialization. Somebody probably got really discouraged and didn't have the patience. Rogi, who's had birds for 25 years, says the colorful birds usually pick one person to bond with, like this parrot, whose old life was with a couple. He was attached to the female, but the couple had a baby and had to get rid of him. Rogi says on occasion the female will come spend a little time with him, giving him a short escape from his caged existence. And he's a totally different bird. He sits on her shoulder, he kisses her, he nestles. It's really sad. When his old owner leaves, Rogi says the bird's frustrated and confused for weeks. They, they miss their families. I mean, those animals miss their people. And so they're taken away from that. Because they're in captivity, these animals usually do live a lot longer. But their life in a cage is far from ideal. Death for them is a sad situation, but it's freeing. They're no longer just behind bars inside of this cage or being someone's pet in their backyard or in their garage. While they can't run free, tomorrow night we'll meet some more of the volunteers and see how they help the captive animals live out their lives at the sanctuary as comfortable as possible. It's a role that pays no money and carries even less recognition. A local wildlife sanctuary wouldn't exist without the help of volunteers to keep it running. Eliana Sheriff brings us part three of Behind the Fence, Voices of the Wildlife Sanctuary. Eliana? Thanks, Steve and Julie. It's a never-ending struggle driven by compassion and powered by perseverance. Tonight, we'll meet some of the people whose blood, sweat, and tears make the sanctuary what it is. Like I said, if I don't do it, who will do it? I'd like to think they wouldn't starve. Volunteer Pat Rogie has a job. So it's kind of a labor of love. That's for the birds. I have scars from working in here, from these birds biting. Rogie is one of dozens of volunteers at the Spirit of the Hills Wildlife Sanctuary, coming on their own volition all year round. So that's what we do every morning. Come rain or come shine. Because the animals have to eat. I like watching the pigs just like chow down and do their crazy little pig thing. They've become part of my family, which is maybe a weird thing to hear. I know their personalities and their likes and dislikes. Many volunteers form special bonds with the creatures and critters, but sometimes an animal can turn against a handler. Yeah, there's, there's some things that they choose not to like me, and I get that. And I don't know why. I think karma, they know that I'm the reason that they're here, that they were taken away. And many of the animals associate faces with bad memories, like how Lupin, a wolf hybrid, views Michael. He had a collar um, embedded in his neck when he came, and so when the vet removed it, I had to treat it every day. And for, from that time, he will, like, he'll ch- lunge at my face.
Like any living thing, the animals can get sick or need routine medical care, especially the big cats. Um, because of the nature of what they eat, they do suffer a lot of tooth issues. And, uh, of course, they live so much longer here than they do in the wild that uh, these become problems as time goes on. The price tag simply to sedate a lion or tiger? Veterinarian Dr. Elsom, who practices locally, says it's around $500, but he donates his services to help care for the animals. <laughs> and volunteering can change one's perspective on life. I think the biggest takeaway is that life matters, no matter what frame it comes in or what form it comes in. And the Canadian man, on a mission to help animals, says running the sanctuary takes a team effort. One. And so everybody does their part um, to keep this place going. And, and there's my, you know, my responsibility again to those humans that have given so much here that I got to do this. Some say animals can't talk, but one thing's for sure. These volunteers are always listening and hear the voices of the wildlife loud and clear. If you'd like more information on volunteering or making a donation, you can visit spiritofthehillsanctuary.org.